Ladies and gentlemen, if you can uh, uh, find your seats, please, and we'll start in a moment. Thank you very much. Thank you for those who are following us by live stream. I apologize that we're starting slightly late. And ladies and gentlemen, if you can sit down now, we're just about to begin. Thank you very much. I'm Alex Vines and I'm head of the Africa program at Chatham House. Welcome to all of you on behalf of the Institute and Halo Trust. This meeting, as you've observed, is on the record. We are live streaming and you're free to tweet. So do tweet, for example, at, at Africa Prog or hashtag CHAfrica. It was in Angola, working as a UN election observer in September 1992, that I first encountered landmines. I was in Masango, Malange province, and I walked into an unmarked minefield and nearly triggered one, a Soviet-era POMS II. Thankfully, an Angolan stopped me from walking further into that field by shouting, Perigo Emina, and he stopped me making a few further steps. I had a near miss. Many Angolans were less fortunate. And 17 years after the end of its civil war, Angola remains one of the most heavily landmine contaminated countries in the world. The human cost was highlighted in January 1997 by Diana, Princess of Wales, walking through a partly cleared minefield in central Angola and speaking to landmine survivors. That trip helped to influence many governments to stop using anti-personnel landmines and to support mine action. Her son, His Royal Highness the Duke of Sussex, has continued to support international mine action and visited in Angola in 2013. As you know, we are welcoming the Duke of Sussex back to Chatham House today, as it's the second anniversary of his opening of our Stavros Niakos Foundation floor. As part of that opening exercise two years ago, the Duke also contributed to our first scenario exercise in our then new simulation center. The exercise explored how to respond to a humanitarian emergency that required landmine clearance, drawing on the Duke's work in the field of landmine eradication. People, and some of you are here today, with experience of Angola and the region participated. You will find on the, in your packs, on your seats, an all-party parliamentary group on Angola briefing note on mine action in Angola. This was produced by our Africa program analysts at Chatham House because uh, we provide the secretariat for that APPG. The note highlights that the Angolan government has committed to clearing its landmines by 2025 in cooperation with international partners. But this target will only be achievable if, there is, if the decline in funding from international donors is reversed. And we'll hear more about that shortly. The APPG briefing note also underlines the demining of agriculture and conservation areas of Angola and that they need to be prioritized. As you will hear shortly, Angola has the potential to host one of the most diverse wildlife populations on the continent. But the presence of landmines still renders large areas of the country unsafe, both for wildlife and for the local people. So I'm delighted today that in partnership with HALO, we're hosting this conference meeting on mine clearance, conservation, and economic development in Angola. I can think of nobody better to open this event than inviting His Excellency Dr. Rui Jorge Caneiro Mangueira, the ambassador of the Republic of Angola, to come up and make a few welcoming remarks. Um, ambassador Mangueira, good to see you, and please, five minutes. Thank you. Good morning. 
thank you all for that. And uh, His Excellencies, I can see uh, a lot of well-known faces here, uh, MPs, ambassadors, and I would like to say that uh, this is an event that is very important for Angola. First of all, I have to say that Angola is in peace for the last 17 years, but the remains of the war are still in Angola. And the landmine issue is something that is very important to remove because we have our economic development in our way and we need, of course, to work in order to remove this, that landmines. But uh, before I continue, I would like to invite all of persons present here to, for a minute, minute of silence to, in memory to all the persons that lost their lives because of anti-person landmines. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we have today, as has been pointed out and today, uh, our Minister for Environment will point the situation in Angola. There are sites in Angola very well, um, very uh, populated with landmines. We have challenges in order to protect our environment first, secondly, the wildlife, and also our forests in Angola. Angola has also a lot of challenges. It's not because of it's my country, but it's a country, beautiful country, with a lot of challenges in terms of tourism. Tourism today is, Angola could be one of the most beautiful destinations and we have today testimonies about how Angola is beautiful from National Geographic, which did a lot of work on this regard. We have projects also in agriculture. We have also projects in another sectors of our economy. But all these issues are depending on how we can remove the landmines in Angola. We have more than 250 sites in Kwandukubang province. We have more than 150 sites in Mushiku provinces. And we have also another sites in other areas too. So we believe that the government did a lot since uh, for the past 10 years. Uh, our international support has been uh, slowed down for so many reasons. But today, Angola needs, of course, uh, the support of international community to work together with us in order to complete that work. And we need to complete that work. That's why, with the support of Alotrust in, in partnership with Chatham House, Today, we are discussing the possibility to join the international community for this action. Just to conclude, I have to say that uh, we are in peace, but we need, of course, that support in order to remove what was the war in Angola. And we need to develop the country without landmines. That's what today, we need to your presence here. And we thank all of us and all of you to be here today with us to discuss that issue. Thank you very much. Ambassador Mangueira, thank you very much for opening the conference. 
I now have the pleasure of welcoming Clark Cooper, who's the Assistant Secretary of State for Political Military Affairs of the US Department of State, to, to give a short presentation. Um, delighted you could make it, and uh, the US has been an important partner of Angola uh, since the end of the conflict uh, in terms of mine action. So I'm looking forward to hearing um, about what has happened and what the US is planning to do. Thank you very much. Please come up. Thank you. Good morning. First, I'd like to thank Chatham House and the Halo Trust. The United States is proud to be a long-standing partner of the government of Angola, and we want to continue to support mine action. We're also a proud partner with the United Kingdom, and we want to address the threat that landmines are not just in Angola as a threat, but all around the world. This is a global mission for us in the United States. It is an honor to be here today with Ambassador Mangueira to discuss the humanitarian mine action and the necessity of clearing explosive remnants of war. Landmines, as well as, which I'm quite familiar with, improvised explosive devices. As the Assistant Secretary of State for Political Military Affairs, and as a combat veteran, I am proud to oversee the U.S. government's conventional weapons destruction, or, as many know in this audience, CWD. That assistance program, which includes humanitarian demining assistance. And I'm even prouder to say that the United States has done more than more than any country at this time to clear landmines and other explosive remnants of war that, that particularly threaten innocent civilians and undermine stability in just day-to-day -day life around the globe. Since 1993, the United States has provided over $3. billion dollars in CWD assistance and programming in more than 100 countries worldwide. This is to reduce the harmful effects of at risk, the illicit trafficking or illicit proliferation, the indiscriminate use of conventional weapons of war. Just in 2018 alone, the United States provided over 189 million in global CWD assistance to nearly 50 countries over five continents. The United States is very fortunate that in our demining assistance is part of a broader CWD program designed to enhance civilian security. Not only does this encompass humanitarian demining, but it also works to reduce threats. And these threats are associated with the stockpiling of at-risk small arms, light weapons, as well as conventional munitions. Meanwhile, hazards in placed by the landmines, as well as any unexploded ordnance, which includes cluster munitions, remnants, artillery shells, mortars. These continue to maim and kill people long, long, long after the conflicts have concluded. These explosive hazards prevent the safe use of land, which suppresses economic development and prevents displaced persons from actually returning home. And in today's fiscally constrained environment, not just in the US, mind you, it is vitally vitally clear that we need to demonstrate how humanitarian mine action assistance benefits the national interest more broadly. For us, that means linking our CWD assistance programs to international security, not separate portfolio, but well integrated portfolio. Protecting civilians is a prerequisite for achieving any kind of peace and stability. Whether it is children going to school, business people carrying out their commerce, farmers cultivating their fields, or shepherds tending to their flocks, men, women, and children must be protected from the risk of ERW. As long as these dangers persist, it is difficult for communities to recover from conflict. And when communities never recover from a humanitarian crisis, they continue to remain susceptible to instability and risk. ERW can threaten international peace and security by killing and maiming civilians, blocking humanitarian assistance, preventing internally displaced people from returning home, and fomenting instability. We've seen this in many places, and particularly we've seen this in the Middle East, where ISIS left behind hundreds of thousands of IEDs 
scattered among critical infrastructure, farmland, schools, hospitals, and homes as they fled from coalition forces. And we see it currently in Yemen, where the Houthi forces have laid an estimated one million landmines and IEDs, making the country one of the most heavily mined in the entire world. There, beginning March, this past March, U.S.-funded demining teams managed by the United Nations Development Program and staffed by Yemeni deminers cleared and removed over 1,200 explosive hazards from the Red Sea Mills in Hudaydah port. This was enabling the World Food Program to begin processing 51,000 metric tons of wheat for distribution to the hundreds and thousands of hungry, if not starving, Yemenis. Humanitarian mine action also increases aggregate economic activity by removing the barriers to development. Clearing U.S. origin munitions in Laos enables farmers to complete the rice harvest without fear. In Colombia, they increase in mining operations following to the peace accord between the government and the FARC has returned vast tracts of land to bring about agricultural production, bringing economic benefits to people ravaged by a half a century of civil war. I also think it may be helpful to draw a comparison with another country that is closer to the finish line, and I talked to some of you about this before today, and that's Sri Lanka, because it illustrates how international donors can rally around a national program dedicated to reaching completion with concrete and ambitious, but realistic goals. The government of Sri Lanka has made mine action a priority for post-war remediation, redemption, reconciliation, all of those efforts. Sri Lanka is focused on returning land to productive use and helping IDPs and refugees return to their homes and their livelihoods. After creating a very robust national mine action program, Sri Lanka increased their national contribution and convinced international donors to invest in their 2020 completion goal. A very, very robust goal, I might add. I had the privilege of visiting Sri Lanka just a couple of weeks ago and visited a demining program in the field. I was able to witness firsthand how humanitarian mine actions promote stability while drawing nations closer together to advance common goals on the international stage. Although demining may not be completed until slightly after 2020, Sri Lanka is a success story for mine action because it shows how clear focus and post-conflict clearance can pave the way for stable, secure, and a prosperous future. In Africa, we unfortunately have seen an alarming increase in protracted conflicts such as trans-regional terrorist activity and intercommunal violence in the Sahel, the persistent al-Shabaab insurgency in Somalia, and continued instability in Angola's neighbor, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Against this backdrop, we understand the clearing of ERW and fostering development in Angola and other countries takes on a whole new meaning. Angola's prosperity bolsters its role as a net security provider in the region which in turn helps protect its natural treasures, as the ambassador cited this morning. National treasures such as, such as the, the riverine region in the Delta and in bringing that back into commerce. These are areas experiencing the ravages of war and getting a turning a corner. Angola exemplifies how humanitarian mine action is a crucial step in helping countries recover from conflict and lay the groundwork for reconstruction and lay the groundwork for development. Since 1995, the United States has invested over 131 million in conventional weapons destruction efforts in Angola, the vast majority which has supported demining operations. Over 1.4 million Angolans have directly benefited from this U.S. assistance, both in terms of not just increased safety, but also access to that arable land that land for development. We've also reduced the availability of weapons uh, to illicit arms traffickers by destroying over 101,000 excess small arms and light weapons left over from the war and providing physical security and stockpile management improvements at Angola's National Weapons Depot. 
Thanks to the concerted efforts of international donors and the government of Angola, international operators estimate that they have cleared 60% of all known minefields there. Despite this remarkable progress, and it is indeed remarkable, we are here today because much work must still be done in Angola for a nation to fully heal and unlock its economic potential. Additionally, with a newfound focus on conserving the Okovango River Basin, as Ambassador Mangara has cited, there is tremendous opportunity there. And we want to see help Angola fully realize the economic potential of its national parks by clearing explosive hazards there and in the vicinity as well. In simplest terms, today's event is focused on finishing the job in Angola, both for the prosperity of its people and environmental conservation. Another one close to my heart as a former assistant director of my National Park Service uh, in an earlier, earlier day. To that end, the United States applauds the government Angola for its significant contribution to demining. By putting its money where its mouth is, in a colloquial way, but in a very true way, the government of Angola has demonstrated to the world its commitment to rid itself of ERW. From the United States perspective, having such a committed partner, it is vital to achieve our common goals of stability and security. And we are very proud to stand alongside our partners of Angola throughout this effort. Angola is a case study, and it's a case study for the whole life cycle of mine action programming, the emergency response, the long-term efforts to steadily reduce contamination, and the final push, the final push to finish the job. We have a unique opportunity to build momentum and to accelerate, accelerate the progress in Angola. At the same time, from a global perspective, Angola helps us understand how clearing ERW is a critical first step to development and stability around the world. The United States is proud to support the peace and the prosperity of the Angolan people and of the people around the world through our continued dedication to conventional weapons destruction and related programs. Thank you so much. R. Clark Cooper, the Assistant Secretary of State for Political Military Affairs, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I would like now to invite the Right Honourable Rory Stewart MP, Secretary of State for International Development, to talk about international support for mine action. Uh, this isn't a new subject for Rory. As you know, he's worked in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq. He was also, uh, prior to becoming Secretary of State for International Development, uh, was the junior minister in the Foreign and Commonwealth Office uh, uh, responsible for Africa, among other things. Uh, Honourable Rory, thank you very much for coming this morning. I know you have a busy schedule. I invite you to the podium. Well, the, the one thing I wasn't going to cancel in my day is, is coming to join you, because this is a project which gives me so much pride in what the international community is doing what governments like the government of Angola are doing, what our, our great friends and partners, the United States government, are doing, and above all, what wonderful uh, British charities such as Halo and Mine Action and others are doing to deal with something which isn't actually fundamentally something that we normally think of in terms of development, but something that is about humanity. It's about our definition of what kind of world we want to live in of what we believe morally is or is not acceptable. And for me, as for most people in the room, the question of minds is something that touches me, like you personally, like many people in this room. Uh, I have seen what happens when somebody steps on a mine. I've worked very closely with people who've survived stepping on a mine, in fact, employed people who've survived stepping on a mine. My father, uh, I remember very clearly looking at the large chunk out of his uh, leg uh, from explosive ordnance as a child and wonder at this huge gash in his thigh, which remained even when he was in his 70s. By the time he was in his early 90s, uh, the, the wound had begun to go, but it was there 50 years after the, after the impact. Uh, 
And of course, many of the people that I employed in Afghanistan uh, were uh, missing limbs from mines, legs. I also uh, feel this very strongly because I want to pay tribute to the people who work in this field. Many of the most talented people that I was lucky enough to work with in my life have ended up working in mine action, which shows me whatever we say about the statistics, and I can stand here and talk about the amazing number of hectares that have been cleared and the percentage that have been cleared and all that means for economic development and livelihoods and agriculture and indeed for national parks and so much else. But the real thing that tells me it's a good thing to do is the quality of the human beings that I know are dedicating their life to it. And that begins in my life with my friend General James Cowan, who was my adjutant when I was a very young and incompetent 19-year-old officer in the Black Watch, but it goes on also to uh, the extraordinary people who worked for me when I was running an NGO in Kabul in Afghanistan for three years, and I lost three of my most talented employees uh, to go off uh, to work for Halo. And they were some of the toughest, bravest, smartest people I knew, and indeed one of them popped up in Angola. So for me, this is woven all the way through my earliest memories of the wound in my father's thigh through myself shuffling around on a rainy parade ground as a young officer at the age of 19 through my whole life in Afghanistan. And I think the thing that brings it together for me and the reason I've been so proud in a small way as a Rishni, a DFID minister, to put my small part of the budget into supporting this was that I felt we had lost a trick in international development, that the point about international development isn't simply about development with a capital D. In other words, it's not just about the question of how you raise incomes, although that's very important. We have a huge obligation to the poorest people in the world. But it isn't just the what, it's the how. It's what kind of world we want to live in, what we feel is acceptable, what we don't feel is acceptable. And these particular weapons, so brutal, so indiscriminate, so hidden, so long-lasting in their impact, represent something which should fill us all with a sense of ethical abhorrence. And I'm very, very proud that in the work that we do in international development, we think not just about incomes, but about protection. Now, that might be protection of the climate, it might be protection of environment, it might be protection of human rights. But above all today, and the reason that I was so proud to partner with these wonderful organizations two and a half years ago and put more money from the Department of International Development in is because of this issue, the protection of people from a weapon that we should never have invented, a weapon that we should never have lain in the ground, and a weapon that I wish to work with all of you to eliminate from the world. Thank you all very much indeed for your work. I now want to invite Lord Boateng to come up um, and start the panel for a discussion. So, Lord Boateng, if you can come up. Thank you very much. I'll hand over to your good offices. Yeah. Good, good. We're going to be told where to sit. I'm sitting here. Good, good. There's a seating order. Or? There's a seating order, and this lady's going to show us exactly okay. where we are. Good, good. Hi. Good to see you. Okay. Welcome. My name is Paul, Paul Boating, and I'm chairing uh, this uh, session. Uh, welcome to uh, hashtag uh, CH Africa. Uh, welcome to what is going to be, I know, an exciting uh, panel session. It's one which belongs to us all. It belongs to the wider World Wide Web who will be participating. It belongs to you who are present in the room in terms of your opportunity uh, to uh, ask questions, to make uh, statements. Uh, there are some ground rules. Uh, first and foremost, time. We've got one hour and 20 minutes. Uh, now, uh, we're being very strict uh, about time. Uh, so that means that if you are from Angola 
and that, I'm afraid, does not include you, Excellency. You're from Britain. Uh, if you are from Angola, you've got five minutes. Uh, if you're not, you've got three minutes. And this is not uh, sort of those of you who've uh, been in sessions I've uh, chaired before know that this isn't academic. Uh, this will go off uh, after three minutes. And it goes on making a noise until you stop. It's as simple uh, as that. When it comes to questions, they are questions, please, short to the point. If you're not asking a question, make a statement, short to the point, but let it contribute to the whole. And what is the whole? Each and every one of us is here because we, we, we care about Angola, first and foremost, do we not? Uh, we believe uh, that Angola's future and potential is being held back by landmines, by the legacy of conflict. We believe, too, that we can do something about it. So this is action-orientated. Uh, we have in uh, my part of West Africa, and I think it's, it's, it's in yours, too, uh, Excellency, uh, we, have, we have a saying uh, that it's each and every feather that makes the eagle soar. And that's a, a reference to that, that great bird that is a symbol not just of Africa, but also Assistant Secretary of State uh, of uh, your uh, uh, great country, uh, the, the eagle. And if you think about an eagle, it's all the feathers, different shapes, different sizes, different weights, different colors. It's all the feathers working together that gives that great bird its flight. When we think about the issue that we're addressing today, it's all, is it not, about linkages. It's about the linkages between sustainable livelihoods, biodiversity, mine clearance. It's about the different skills that are required if we are to achieve our purpose. Yes, they're technical, they're cultural, they are policy orientated, they involve defense experts, environmentalists, diplomats, conservationists, all different skills, different talents. They are all represented in this room all represented in this room. And we are fortunate to have the panel we have because they are all represented on this panel. So let's give them a round of applause, shall we? To get them going. <laughs> and uh, we are going, we're going to uh, begin uh, with Dr. Andriano Gonzalez, who heads, uh, uh, head of international relations at the National Intersectional Commission for Demining and Humanitarian Assistance. So would you like to go up there? Oh, yeah. Because mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I know you, you want to say something to us. Thank you. Uh, you've got five minutes uh, to say Thank it. Thank you very much. Uh, as you do, I'd just like you to reflect really on, uh, on this issue, which for us is an important one. It's been 17 years since the end of the conflict, and Angola has ratified the Ottawa Landmine Ban Treaty. Give us your sense of what the Angolan government has achieved during that period in the field of mine action, and what it is about the contribution of Angola that has made you most, most proud. Thank you very much. Um, I, I know um, in, uh, that most of the people know the history of Angola, how Angola became uh, highly affected uh, in landmine and the ER debris, explosive uh, remnants of war. So we had 14 years of uh, independence struggle against the, the, to get the independence from the Portuguese colonizer and which the landmine has been used. And, and uh, also 27 years of the uh, civil war. So these are uh, so many actors um, planting mines indiscriminately. So this is a result of the, the Angolan being so highly affected with land mine and the ERW. So um, the demining program in Angola uh, started, uh, humanitarian demining started in 1995. 
and uh, the uh, support uh, of uh, UN. And uh, so we, Angola, uh, signed the convention, the Convention of Land Mine, Ban Land Mine, in 1997. Um, we knew in that time that uh, we were not in a position to ratify um, because the, the war still uh, was on. So just in 2000, 2002, uh, July 2002, Angola submitted to the United Nations, to the Secretary of the United Nations, the instrument of ratification. So in 2003, Angola became the party of the, the convention. So complying with the convention itself, in to, uh, uh, 2007, uh, Angola destroyed all plant mines in stock, stockpile, uh, in all its territory, its territory. And uh, so I'm trying to, <laughs> to start with the time. Um, in, um, so, uh, so we had the, the, to comply with the Article 5, the Ottawa Convention, to clear all the landmines, known landmines, uh, in our territory, in Angolan territory and the area of jurisdiction. So we knew that the first 10 years uh, given by the Convention would, be, would not be um, easy to comply with. Uh, so as you know, Angola is a, a, uh, is a very huge country and with a lot of uh, inaccessibility and also the um, resources were not uh, sufficient to be able to comply with the, ten, the first 10 years of the given by the Article 5 of the Ottawa Convention. So we submit our second, our first extension request under the, uh, the, the, the Article 5. Um, the first extension request uh, prior to the first extension request, I would like to say that uh, uh, CNIDA was created, Mine Action Authority was created in 2001, uh, September 2001. So from the time CNIDA was created, a lot of demand has been coming from national and international to know the reality, what's, uh, what extent of uh, contamination Angola, Angola were in that time. So what we have to, uh, in order to have some uh, information or baseline, so we had to undergo for LIS, LIST, Landmine Impact, Land Impact Survey. And so this, uh, we made this first um, survey between 2000, 2004, 2007. And this was the result of the, the, this, uh, the Landmine Impact Survey was that uh, um, 3,492 um, 3, 3, areas have been affected and with uh, uh, 1,888 uh, population community impacted. So uh, we knew that in advance that uh, the, this uh, information was not accurate uh, because uh, we we learned from Mozambique, our neighbor from Mozambique, that uh, uh, this was something that give you some idea, but is not accurate. But we need something to start on, and from then we start moving on. In 2000, uh, 2016, so we had this number completely uh, reduced. And in 2000, 2016, so uh, the, the number of 3,493 came to 1,435 areas. So this uh, was because we carry on um, in, during the, 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 the first extension request uh, for five years. We request for five years after 2013. So we had, <laughs> so, <laughs> that's true, wrong. So we carry on no technical survey, technical survey and the clearance. So that's why we managed to reduce considerably. It's good to say that 90% uh, of this reduction was for non-technical survey because the, the LIS gave us the figures overestimated. So today, just, just 
Today we, we are better off. Our database is being con uh, conciliated with the operators, and we have in our database 1,220 um, 1, areas, which uh, in extension is uh, uh, one, 105 million uh, square meters. So this is uh, our reality at the moment, based on our database, and so all the operators are working based on this uh, uh, by baseline. Thank you very much uh, indeed, uh, Andriano, and not just for your discipline, but also uh, for all that your government has done in terms of intentionality and focus. It's set an example uh, to others, so thank you uh, for that. Uh, over to you, Jessica. You have three minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, it's quite intimidating, um, but it's good because when I'm nervous, I talk faster, so I'll get through this. Um, I think that the question that was asked of me is, is I have a background in arms control, particularly conventional arms control, and which of the arms control treaties are relevant for Angola, um, and how do these help its international re-engagement uh, at the moment? I think I have to start by saying when it comes to the arms control regimes, they are all relevant for all states that value stability and security in a rules-based international system, and particularly for states working to recover from periods of conflict, such as Angola. But that said, it makes practical and pragmatic sense to encourage states to fulfill their obligations under the re regimes that they have ratified. And for Angola, that is the Ottawa Treaty. And indeed, we also have to remember that Angola has an emblematic status as the country where global attention first focused on the damage done by landmines when Princess Diana uh, visited in 1997. And the core of the convention remains saving lives and preventing injury. Angola now has, as you have heard, a stated goal of being landmine free by 2025. And that date is also currently the global goal for the treaty itself following the Maputo Declaration of 2014. Now, full clearance will not only demonstrate Angola's commitment to its international obligation under the treaty, but it will also make a huge contribution to Angola's social and economic reform and development. Making the country safe for the free movement of people and goods will enable the development of business, industry, agriculture, and tourism and will encourage the foreign investment to support those, those areas. And all of these are key to the diversification and growth of eco Angola's economy. Of course, the greatest challenge to reaching the Maputo 2025 aspiration is resource. And levels have fluctuated over the years. Angola is currently benefiting from the expertise of British and international demining organizations such as Halo Trust and Mines Advisory Group, and they are training Angolans in demining skills, giving ordinary people skills, and particularly, I'm proud to say, giving women skills. Apparently, women make very good deminers. The UK is funding work under DFID's Global Mine Action Programme, but there is more than enough work to share with other donor, donor nations, such as the United States, Japan, and others. And we are seeing uh, new inputs, such as increasing business engagement and support, particularly from the international oil companies who are operating in Angola. And that is very welcome and gratifying. But the onus remains on Angola itself, of course, to share the burden with the international donors. And we are open to exploring innovative funding solutions to help Angola achieve the Ottawa Treaty goals as soon as possible. And overall, therefore, there can be no stronger signal of Angola's renewal and re-emergence on the international stage than its eventual declaration that the country is finally free of the threat of landmines and a safe place for its population and for foreign visitors and investors. Thank you very much. Now that's timing for you. 
Um, we're now going to hear from Major General Todd James Cowan, uh, CB, who heads up HALO. He's going to tell us something about the challenges that you're going to face in the uh, impact of your work. Where what we're talking about here in terms of conservation does represent a departure for HALO. So we're look, looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Um, I suspect half the people in this room know nothing about landmines. And I had some prepared words, and I worry for you that this may all be a bit baffling. And I want to just bring it down to what this is really about. The Kavango Zambezi conservation area holds 50% of the world's elephants. That is a remarkable statistic in its own right. It covers different countries, and wildlife don't recognize international borders. And the Achilles heel of the Kaza, as it's called, is sadly Angola. Because during that terrible war that we've heard about, so many minefields were laid, often by South Africans and often with very sophisticated and lethal landmines, that not only are those apex species, such as elephant, killed by landmines, uh, there is also poverty that rises directly from the presence of these many hundreds of minefields. And the communities that live in this area cannot develop economically and become reliant upon poaching and bushmeat. So these species suffer a double threat, directly and indirectly from landmines. So that is what we're seeking to achieve here, something quite remarkable. There is, in fact, a surplus of wildlife in Zambia and Botswana in terms of the major apex species. But if they try and travel across the border into Angola, they're either killed or they're poached. And we want to change that. We've worked in Angola now for over 20 years. We know this country well. We have a wonderful relationship with our Angolan friends. And I'd like to acknowledge the support of the Angolan government through its many representatives here today, Ambassador. Thank you very much. But what we think of as the Halo Trust is, in fact, Halo Angola. We feel at one with the people of Angola. And when I talk about conservation, I do not simply wish to put animals first. We want to put people first. We are a humanitarian organization because the effects that landmines have are to ensure that communities cannot flourish. And we believe that we can achieve something uh, that is both for the wildlife and for the people. If we can allow communities to flourish, if we can allow them to diversify uh, their income sources through uh, ecotourism and through agriculture, then they will not rely on bushmeat. They will not kill these species. And then Angola's own economy will be able to diversify away from oil. That is the prize that we're here today to achieve. Now, what we want to do is we once had a workforce of about 1,200 in Angola. We've come down through cuts, sadly, to funding uh, to below 500. Uh, we have a plan, and we are funded now to be able to increase that workforce back to 1,200 deminers. Half of those uh, new deminers will be women. And when we can give a job to a woman, we can have an exponential effect in terms of uh, the support we bring. And thereby, uh, we will move into this very remote area, this very beautiful part of the world, uh, and we will clear the 153 minefields uh, that are there uh, and identified for us to work on. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Shall we give a, a warm uh, Chatham House welcome to His Royal Highness, the Duke of Sussex? Welcome, sir, and thank you very much for joining us today. You were here two years ago and helped initiate this important initiative. We're now going to hear from Dr. Kai Collins, and I mentioned the multidisciplinary nature uh, of the challenges that we face. Dr. Collins has been engaged in research in both local communities and in demining agencies. So it's both the cultural, the sociological, uh, and uh, the technical and policy. We're looking forward enormously to hearing what you're saying, what you're going to say, and, and sharing with us the potential for the sustainable return of wildlife and the benefit that that will bring to the people of the region. Over to you. Can I talk from here? Wherever you're most comfortable. Okay, great. Um, 
The National Geographic Okavango Wilderness Project has been um, working in the remote parts of southeastern Angola, uh, conducting biodiversity surveys since 2015, um, in a very close partnership with Halo Trust. Scientists had not been into that landscape in about 40 years prior to um, the initial expeditions. And we couldn't even get the teams in uh, to start the exploration by a uh, dugout canoe, a traditional um, canoe from Botswana, uh, without the assistance of Halo, um, guiding us through two of uh, the most heavily mined regions in that area. And so under the curtain of the, these minefields, the, the team went and uh, started these exploration expeditions using local guides um, from the landscape, uh, the Luchazi people, and then also uh, polars from Botswana. So they were brought up, the river bushmen, and their knowledge of, of the landscape and how to navigate these rivers and stay safe from hippos. Landmines on the bank, hippos and crocodiles in the water. Um, so they conducted over 9,000 kilometers of, of surveys from the highlands of Angola into the Okavango Delta and down to the Makarikari salt pans, 120 days of eating rice and beans and camping on the banks of the um, source rivers of the Okavango. So they've done extensive surveys uh, since 2015 and 11 new species to science and published, 70 currently being described. Sometimes scientists take their time, so we're trying to shimmy them as long as possible. But an incredible um, biodiversity inventory in this landscape that has been understudied for, for decades. And the people as well. Uh, many of those tribes and villages haven't had any contact uh, with national government because of that remoteness, because the only way to get in there is by motorbike or bicycle or on foot. And that obviously makes it difficult for the government to assist them in development, to bring in infrastructure, healthcare, education. Uh, and that is because of the mines. So, so the, this project is looking at how to create a conservation economy. It's a partnership that uh, National Geographic has, has started. It was signed um, last year with uh, Your Excellency, Honorable Minister of Environment and Minister of Tourism from Angola and the National Geographic Society committing funding uh, $10 million over the last uh, five years and, and significant funding going forward to create a conservation economy in, in, in these provinces of Mexico and Cuando Cubango. So the opportunity is there of wildlife populations that just need to recover and be protected from poaching and mine removal so the local communities can get assistance from, out, from the outside world and from donors to take ownership of the natural resources there, manage them, and eventually the idea is to bring in ecotourism benefits directly to themselves so they can increase and improve their livelihoods. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And Thank you for keeping exactly to time. Um, Kadu, Kadu Sembunya, CEO of the African Wildlife uh, Foundation. You're based in Nairobi, you work throughout uh, the region. Give us uh, your sense of some of the links between socioeconomic development and conservation and some positive regional examples of community-driven conservation initiatives. Yeah, th thank you very much. Uh, I think I will start by, you know, we, we work across Africa and we have a couple of conservation enterprises, uh, over 60, and the return on them is about $2 million to the communities annually. So we've had the experience in this. What has worked for us is that really the engagement of governments and communities and address the idea of the false choice that sometimes is taken between conservation and development. We are not going to have conservation without development. We are not going to have development without conservation. And start, that's the beginning of the, of the, of the discussion. Uh, communities are crucial. Where we've succeeded, there are things which have worked. I think that Virungas is one of the examples of the mountain gorillas. They are the only apes which, whose population is increasing. We've been engaged for 40 years in the region. We've brought three countries, Rwanda, DRC, and Uganda together to manage an ecosystem that manages the mountain gorillas. Uh, the idea there is tourism, but also it's water as a, a tank, a uh, water tank for the, for, the, for, the, for the region. What is so important, and I want to emphasize this, is that tourism, while it's important, shouldn't be the only idea 
that communities need to benefit, and that is should be crucial. A lot of these important areas in Africa don't really attractive for tourism, but they are, they are important. So the idea of linking other aspirations and livelihoods like agriculture to the water, the, the wetlands, is so important in this in the, in, in this uh, negotiations and, and and development. But I think the central thing is the community benefit. It's not only benefit, ownership, and rights. This comes from the land tenure arrangement that needs to be approved and legally recognized. The voice of the people is very important in the construct, construction of these kind of uh, projects, uh, but also the leakage between this sort of environmental aspect, the leakage between the, the, minister, the Minister of Environment and the Minister of Finance and the Minister of Energy is very, very important. All government sectors, like we are on the panel, Lord, Lord is it's so important that the government also works in that nature. Conservation is not a side issue. It's part of our energy needs. It's part of our culture. Sometimes it's our names. Sometimes it's our religion. Sometimes it's, 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 it's our identity. All those things need to come together. It's not only about the business aspects of conservation, it's also more about who we are as Africans. So the connection of those dots to what we are trying to do is so important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that and for making the link with the whole issue of identity, the difference it makes to a herdsman or a woman farmer to be able to take the most direct route to market rather than having to try and go around the mines. We've seen it for ourselves and it's just hugely important and that linkage is, is a vital one to make. Uh, Jane, Dr. Jane Cocking, uh, uh, OBE uh, from the Mines Advisor Group, I mean, you've done so much work out in the field, not just in Africa, but in, in other uh, uh, lo localities. Give us your sense from your Angolan experience about the humanitarian and socio-economic impacts uh, of contamination in Angola, and, and how in particular the rural communities who you've worked so closely with have been affected. Thank you. Decades ago, Angola was an agricultural breadbasket but over a million landmines have contributed to a legacy of war that has left rural Angolans decimated, fearful, and very importantly, unable to use Angola's wonderful natural gifts. Food insecurity is a growing concern. Just last year, there was a 2.5 million ton maize shortfall, and nearly a third of children are stunted largely because of poor nutrition. And the majority of rural families in many communities in Angola just look to subsist by farming. And the prospect of diversifying and valuable cash crops is a distant, project, is a distant prospect. But as we've already heard, the impact of landmines is not just the, the fear that a, a hoe or a, worse still, a child's footprint could trigger a detonation. It's much more wide ranging than that because contamination is frequently around rivers and roads, which prevents access to water and access to markets, which is absolutely essential for any agricultural economy. And the humanitarian aspect of this contamination too is felt by the thousands of Angolans who remain displaced and more than 88,000 people who live with disabilities as a, result of, uh, as a result of landmine injuries. I was in Angola recently, and the sight of MAG teams clearing areas only meters <coughs> away from, uh, from, from where children were playing, from where young people were gossiping, was just excruciating. And one of those young people was uh, a girl called Minga, who, when she was six years old, lost her sight and her right arm to a landmine explosion because she was, she was mistakenly playing with a landmine. And that landmine was laid long, long before she was born. That is simply unacceptable. But 
The flip side of this contamination story is the incredible impact that clearance can have. MAG has handed back nearly 10 million square meters of land to Angolans over the last 10 years. And that is an extraordinary achievement. So rather than giving you lots more numbers though, let me just tell you a short story of the village of Lutsi, which was surrounded by four minefields which have now been cleared by MAG. And in 2010, there were only 66 people living there. Now, there are 2,866. But that's not all. There's, uh, there's a, there are five ball holes, there's a school, there's a clinic, there's a three churches, 10 shops, everything. People have been able to return and rebuild. And so, to paraphrase our defeat colleagues, when we invest in mine action, aid works. So rural Angola is one of the clearest examples of why we must drive towards the goal of a landmine-free 2025. 61 countries need to get across that line. So let's enable Angola to be one of them. And just to finish, uh, just to tell you about Minga, who I mentioned earlier. She's now uh, planning to start work with one of MAG's community liaison teams and her landmine future, landmine free future is strong. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for that, Jane, and also for personalizing around Mingo in the way that you have, because at the end of the day, this is about human beings, vulnerable human beings who are out there, and they have to be present in this room too. Um, we're not going to hear from a, a representative of the Angolan Armed Forces. And uh, James earlier on uh, mentioned the role of the apartheid regime in laying down uh, the mines. And I am of a generation that can remember the heroic battle that the Angolan Armed Forces waged against uh, the apartheid regime and its uh, surrogates uh, in, in Angola. Uh, tell us, if you would, uh, Colonel Conrad how, uh, how important it is for the Angolan Armed Forces now to be landmine-free by 2025, and what positive opportunities could exist in the southeast of Angola if funding efforts were to be increased and were to produce the results we all hope that they will. Thank you, sir. You're from Angola, so you've got five minutes. <laughs> uh, but it will be five minutes. Well, first of all, I would like to thank the chair for the two minutes bonus. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> um, Please allow me to start my short presentation with a quote by the late Secretary General of the United Nations, Kofi Annan, and I quote, not only these abominable weapons lie buried in silence and in their millions, waiting to kill or maim innocent women and children, but the presence or even the fear of the presence of a single landmine can prevent the cultivation of an entire field, rob a whole village of its livelihood, place yet another obstacle on a country's road to reconstruction and development." End of quote. The landmine issue in Angola has gone beyond humanitarian and sociological concerns to bring about environmental damage. Disruption on land stability, pollution and the loss of biodiversity are major ecological consequences of landmines. Landmines have a devastating impact on the economy. It leads to loss of biodiversity, ecological crisis, soil contamination, loss of productivity, threat to food security, community health, poverty and social marginalization. In this regard, landmines pose a threat to sustainable development in the sense that all the above referred to matters are interconnected. I cannot emphasize how critical or useful a mine the land could be if free of these fearful devices. It can, f can be farmed social and economically valuable or even vital for the free movement of people and goods. I would like to draw the attention of the participants to the most prominent ecological issue associated with the landmines presence, which is access denial to vital resources. Although landmines are used by the military for military purposes, they are not, however, restricted to military establishments or sites of military significance. 
Let's take, for instance, the Okavango Zambezi Transfrontier, uh, Transfrontier Conservation Area, a mass of wetland which is bigger than German and Austria combined and nearly twice bigger than the United Kingdom. It aims at establishing a conservation and world-class tourism Transfrontier Conservation Area across the Okavango and Zambezi Rivers Basin in recognition of their role in conserving biodiversity socio-economic development within the framework of sustainable development. The region is a real wilderness wonderland, providing a home to the largest population of elephants in Africa, the second largest population of lions, some of the highest levels of biodiversity on the planet, virgin Arab land and abundant water resources. However, it was also a battleground of many first combats in the recent history of Angola including the major battle fought on the African soil after World War II. I refer to the Battle of Quito Quanaval. As such, the area still has landmines fields scattered throughout its territory, which in spite of government efforts in partnership with the mining companies, still deny human access to parts of the vast resources they put to lives of wildlife, flora, and the entire ecosystems at risk and, pre and prevent tourism to flourish and investors to come in and invest in the region. All these have a negative impact and delay the much desired social and economic development and sustainable development of the region. It is, it is therefore of a paramount importance that the conclusion of the demining working within the 90,080 square kilometer that comprises the area, which includes the Mavinga National Park with 1,098 hectares, the National Park of Luang Luyana, 94 hectares, and of course the Quito Quanaval, uh, the Quito Quanaval thematic park, which uh, uh, comprises of 2,012 hectares, equivalent to the 27.6 percent of the uh, the area to the mine. In order to ensure free movement in the area, as well as the construction of tourism, biodiversity, conservation of infrastructures. To that end, it is of critical that the demining efforts should gain a boost aiming also at the target of declaring the country free of uh, antipersonal landmines by 2025. A target that is achievable as long as there are additional financial resources and joint efforts to that end. Once that is achieved, the region will certainly attract investors, tourists, and farmers who will ensure protection of biodiversity, prompt economic growth, and sustainable development. Now, moving to the question posed by the, the chair, I would want to say that it is of critical. The, the Angolan Armed Forces attach a great importance to the landmines free by 2025, in the sense that, of course, we were one of the, the armies that were you know, part of the conflict. And of course, as such, we have been also part of the, let's say, one of the countries, the armies that have been mining. Also, we put landmines there, uh, of course, to defend the territory and, and the economic establishment. And as such, we would like also to be part of the solution. And uh, the, the importance, of course, for us is that it would be a sense of relief and also mission accomplished. With regards to the infrastructures, as I have referred, of course, there are a lot of potentials. Once the landmines have been cleared and the territory declared clean of any personal landmines, this certainly will prompt tourism and investment in the area. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much indeed for that, Colonel. And you know, it's a good trick, good strategic trick to bring in the chairman's question just at the very end. <laughs> I'm going to remember that one. Uh, but thank you for that. And thank you for reminding us, too, that the aftermath uh, of, that, uh, of that great battle is something that now we can turn to a battle for reconstruction rather than destruction. And this is a call for action. So because of the discipline of our panel, you've got half an hour uh, to make your contribution and to ask uh, questions uh, of, uh, of them. Please, if you've got a brief point you want to make, make it. Don't do a convoluted thing and try and turn it into a question. 
doesn't help. Uh, but it all needs to be focused on action, where we go to next, how we marshal resources, how we bring people uh, together into constructive uh, multidisciplinary partnerships. Over to you, sir. Would you tell us your name and your organization, if you've got one? Thank you very much to the panel um, for your briefing. Uh, my name is James Glancy. I'm a director at the conservation charity Veterans for Wildlife. Uh, and um, I'm MEP-elect for the Southwest. My question is about conservation once you do reach the goal of succeeding of clearing landmines, about the possibility of ensuring that conservation empowers and includes the community. Um, is it possible to create a model where the people feel that there is a value in preserving wildlife? And it, the reason I ask that is some of the projects to work on, especially uh, in South Africa, is that the reserves we work on and we're building feel like they're the preserve of other people mm -hmm. and only they benefit when they come into to that country and the money doesn't uh, flow into the community. Thank you for that. If you'd hold that, Kadu, I'll come to you on that, but we're going to take three questions and then we're going to go to each of you in turn. Kadu, another question. Uh, yeah, sir, at the back. And then I'm looking for a woman to uh, ask a question because we're going to have gender balance in this thing. Yeah. Uh, my name's Stuart Hughes. I'm a BBC journalist, but I'm here in my capacity as a landmine survivor. Um, you referenced the Ottawa Treaty in your opening remarks. Um, I just wanted to ask the panel whether they still think that countries that haven't signed up to the Ottawa Treaty should and will, especially bearing in mind the excellent work that uh, our colleague from the US State Department has said and the amount of money that countries like the US are already putting into mine clearance. Thank you. Jessica, I'm coming to you for that. There's a, a lady... Yes, over there. Amanda Pollinger, um, my day job is CEO of 100 Women in Finance. My, my, my non-profit job is as Halo USA trustee. Um, I'd like to bring up the issue of women um, and, and how, and it get, you know, it gets a little bit more detail on how important you think it is to engage with women in the community through this work. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, indeed. Kai, I'm going to ask you about that and your experience in terms of women in the areas you've worked and what, what they're doing. And perhaps uh, also, uh, because I've seen it for, for myself, James, you could say something about the way you technically uh, empower women. But first of all, over, over to you, Kadu. Yes, thank you very much. I, I, you ask a very important question because uh, over time, just look at the history and the conservation movement on the continent. It's mostly, and we are part of that, we've been on the continent for 59 years, it's mostly foreign-led. And what that has meant is, is when you look at the actions on the ground from the NGOs, when you look at the tourism industry itself, it has created a, a false perception uh, among a lot of my colleagues, my African friends and colleagues, that this whole business is for foreigners. Uh, the addressing that is very important. Uh, there are models we've developed. I've just given a model of Rwanda and uh, Uganda and the other around the Virogas, but there are a couple of models that has worked very well. I, but I think the whole idea and premises developed around ownership and voice around these issues. Uh, the community involvement in the construct is very, very important, but I think when it comes to tourism business, equity, community equity, in the business is very important. And I think what Angola Lord is giving us a, a huge opportunity to change the narrative of conservation. And I think the previous speaker who said the how is going to be very important. How do we construct this in a way that doesn't alienate and develop bold borders between protected areas and communities? who are neighboring these resources. That, that is happening across the continent. Uh, it's a long, I would need five minutes to ask that. Oh, okay, 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 I know. <laughs> thank you very yeah, much yeah. indeed. Thank you. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much indeed for that. Uh, Jessica, you're part of a global uh, network of British ambassadors and high commissioners. Give us your sense of the global situation uh, around treaty obligations. Um, interesting one, around this treaty in particular, I think we have reached a point, if we're going to be honest, where, where we have plateaued off in terms of support and, and recognition for this treaty. Other treaties have come forward and taken people's attention, for example, the arms trade treaty. But I think this one remains particularly relevant. 
Um, you ask particularly about non-signatories. Uh, of course, states that have not signed should sign, but I would also say there are lots of signatories that have not ratified. And I think that's a distinction that is also very important. Once you ratify, you have to do something. Once you ratify, you are bound by this and you are then obliged to contribute to the global effort to, to tackle the problem. I think also there's a dif distinction within that as well between the affected states and the non-affected states. For non-affected states, why should they sign? Why should they ratify? To build global will, I think, is, is the answer to that, and to join the body that is trying to tackle the problem and eliminate landmines as, on a global scale. For those who are affected, obviously, it's to build a support network who can then help tackle the problem within that country. But I think the answer overall has to be yes, it is still relevant. It is still relevant that the states continue to sign, and it's even more relevant that signatories continue to ratify. Thank you. Dr. Collins, Kai, the role of uh, women, uh, the impact of women of, of this particular issue and struggle? I think, um, I mean, the key thing is that women really represent the heart of those communities and a lot of the traditional knowledge. Many of the men were lost in the war, and, and a lot of that traditional knowledge was retained in the women and the elder women in that community. Um, and they play a very cohesive role there. Currently, the men are often doing, uh, going out and, and hunting for bushmeat, which is largely the only source of protein, um, and also working with the women and putting out beehives. And, and uh, that's one of the sustainable products that can, can go into ecotourism and become a major export in the region. Some incredible um, honey comes out of these uh, areas, uh, Moshiko and Kwandukubango provinces. Uh, even nationally within Angola, it's recognized as some of the most amazing honey available. So setting up cooperatives and empowering the women in those communities to benefit from those types of resources. The only agriculture really is on very sandy, nutrient-poor soils is for cassava and um, sorghum. And so once the, the mines can be cleared, and alternative ag agricultural practices, more sustainable agricultural practices can be shared, they will then really be able to um, provide for the families and, and uh, ensure long-term sustainability of those communities. Currently, they have to uh, clear forest, grow cassava for two years on poor soils, and clear more forest and keep shifting on, because they don't have the knowledge of how to do it um, repeatedly using conservation agriculture. Um, so that's a very key thing. And, and just to the point of um, the ownership, the whole focus of the project, we, we only, when we first went into the communities, we went in with community engagement specialists to understand how uh, to approach their culture sensitively. They need to be the ownership, I mean, the owners of, of the natural resources in the landscape. And so the idea as the potential comes for ecotourism, which is not going to fund everything, it'll just fund a portion of the conservation economy is that they will be direct benefactors. They will be, through donor funding, they will be co-investing with ecotourism operators. Um, they will be owning concessions and, and working with the Minister of Environment to ensure that that process is done right from the beginning. Uh, we really have an opportunity to get it right here, and, and this is the plan. Thank you very much. James, I've met some remarkable uh, women D-miners trained by, by HALO. Share your experience. Uh, as you can probably imagine, uh, the, the mine action sector came out of a, an ex-military and therefore very male world. And, uh, and I'm an example of that. But it's been my uh, wish during the last four years to change that. And we have uh, set a, a target of getting to a 50% female workforce. And we have 9,000 staff around the world. And we've already achieved that in countries like Cambodia, where we have a very large workforce in Sri Lanka. Uh, we're already there. So the opportunity here uh, in, in Angola is one that we're going to seize. And it's a team effort. We've heard from Angola, we've heard from the United States, we've heard from the United Kingdom, but our team is supported by other organizations. And I'd particularly like to acknowledge the work of commercial uh, organizations such as BP and NE, and we have a CEO of, of BP here with us this morning. But they've funded us uh, for our 100 Women in Demining project in Angola, uh, in Benguela pro province, and we intend to uh, train 400 of the 800 deminers we're going to recruit uh, for this project. Uh, they're going to be women. But it isn't just enough to recruit women for uh, short-term jobs as deminers. Our role is to create long-term sustainable livelihoods. And where there is a female headed head of uh, household, uh, there is a very disproportionate humanitarian effect. So that's our aim. 
I think it's extremely encouraging. And I mentioned that team, and I'd be very grateful for anyone who wants to support us in that work. Um, this is the chance to do it. Thank you very much indeed for that. It's, it's worth remembering that 60% uh, of Africa's farmers are women. And so anything that impacts on the success of African farming will impact uh, on, on women and their economic security and capacity to contribute towards the development of, uh, of, of agriculture. Some more points, questions? Yes, the lady there. Elizabeth Waifu, I'm the founder of Radix Legal and Consulting a law firm that focuses on African business transactions. I would like to hear more about what is being done to involve local communities in demining, because I'm very well aware that if you can get the local communities to take ownership of a, pro of a program that creates, pe that allows an economic development and then promote peace, then it will be sustainable and it will have to be more impactful. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask Jane and Adriano to say something about that. But first of all, let me, see. yes, sir. Thank you. I'm Nigel Elway. I run the All Party Group on Explosive Threats. I am the founder of the Revive Campaign. And I'm also here on behalf of Sir Bobby Charlton's foundation, Find a Better Way. Um, you asked for calls to action. Um, we've spoken about the importance of mine action in achieving the sustainable development goals. And I would make a plea that um, as much as well as um, uh, James and his team do at clearing explosives, there will always be victims. And BLAST produces a very complex suite of injuries that often require long-term support and care. And I would just like to say that um, you know, victim assistance as a pillar of mine action is another very important um, uh, thread for the conversation. Thank you very much indeed for that. Worth remembering that mines are a public health emergency too. Any other points before I turn to the, yes, lady over there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, my name is Eka Ekwe. I'm from King's College London. I'm also, I'm here, I'm especially interested in this because uh, we have a research project funded by the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, the uh, Global Changes Research Fund, looking at mine clearance. Yeah. Um, where my engineering colleagues actually are creating a new technology that will provide more accurate uh, clearance of anti-vehicle uh, mines using radio signaling. And myself and my colleague are looking at the socioeconomic impact. We also have another project that's looking at the impact of clearance in Angola that's funded by the Irish government, and we're doing that with the Geneva Center. Now, my question really is about um, the extent to which you, uh, members of the panel, see a distinction between antivehicle mines and antipersonal mines. Of course, we know um, antivehicle mines are not actually banned. Um, and we know also that there can be a slightly different impact in terms of mm. the longer term with antivehicle mines when people start using um, heavy equipment for agriculture, for instance. This now crops up as an issue. At the same time, on the ground, when we've done field research, we've not always found that communities feel that strong of a distinction um, across these two uh, a, a sorts of minds. So I'm interested in your uh, opinions on that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Colonel, I'm going to come to you for the distinction between anti-vehicle uh, and anti-personnel um, uh, minds. Uh, but if we could uh, begin with the first, with the first of, those, uh, of those questions, Jane. Thank you. It's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful question and an incredibly important point because clearly what one of the defining characteristics of humanitarian mine action is that needs are defined by those who are most affected by them. And so organizations like MAG work with communities, with local authorities, with governments to set those priorities first where communities really feel that they're going to feel the, the benefit. And how do we do that in practice? I think one of the very important images of mine action 
is uh, the person or the, 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 the dog clearing uh, minefields, but an awful lot of what the work that MAG and organisations like us do is non-technical survey which is our community liaison teams who are absolutely critical members of our operations, going out and spending hour after hour, day after day, sitting down with communities, understanding their perspectives, their knowledge, because people know where these devices are, um, <laughs> because they were there when they were laid, or very sadly, they, they have witnessed the, the impact that they've had. So, a huge amount of our work is done by those community liaison teams. They're the, they're the eyes and ears of organizations like us, but more importantly, uh, they're the voices of, of communities. And so I think it's something that we, we often don't explain perhaps as well as we might in terms of how we do our work. Adriano, oh, thank you. Adriano, we know that demining the Akovango headwaters will bring benefit to over half a million people in the Kwando, Kubango uh, province alone uh, of, uh, of Angola. So give us, give us your sense about community mobilization, community impact, and how the government and peoples of Angola are going about this. Thank you. Um, so uh, just uh, building on of uh, what was, uh, has been said, uh, one of the requirements for operators is to um, liaise with population. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and uh, one of the requirements, uh, as my national authority um, uh, uh, asked for operators, is to perform the mine risk education. So performing mine risk education on the site so they have to involve the community. So they have to contact the local authority, the traditional authorities, and to join. So this is where the, the, most of the community um, became aware of what has been done in the area. So it is, um, and also um, doing so, uh, the population, the community, comes to know how they're going to benefit for the work that's been done in the area. So it's not a point that uh, some kind of work like this, the mining or clearance, or um, saying no technical survey, uh, the people come to ignore it or they are not being taken on board. So this is clear that uh, everywhere the operators go, and to do their, their work. So the, the community comes also um, join to them and also, um, plus most of the, op the, 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 um, the, the miners from the, or the operators are locally recruited. So this is uh, another point that to make the population to get involved also in the, in the, in the project. Thank you for that and for reminding us also of the importance of traditional leadership. Uh, that's, that's key. If you don't have traditional leaders on side and you haven't bothered to have a dialogue that involves them and indeed the spiritual leadership, you're missing, uh, you're, you're missing a very important part uh, of understanding about how communities uh, are, are transformed and transform themselves. Yes, you wanted to make a point. Yes, well, yes. So one, mm. one, one small point that, we, you know, when we discuss communities here, we really be, be mindful that over 70% of the people in Southern Africa are young people. Mm -hmm. yeah. They are below 25. So let's not define communities like these rural people who are adults and, and they can do this. Majority of those people are young people. And the question of the women, they are managed by women. We are not going to be successful if we don't engage the mothers and their sisters because they run the largest population in Africa. Thank you. Important reminder. <laughs> <laughs> and not one any of us are likely to forget. <laughs> At least I'm not. Uh, Colonel, uh, uh, over, uh, over to you. Uh, help us, would you, with this distinction between anti-vehicle landmines and anti-personnel landmines and what the implications of that are going forward. Well, thank you very much. Uh, well, very simple. 
Anti-personal landmines, they are meant for people. Anti-vehicles, for vehicles. Now, the thing is, when the armies they are laying the, the landmines, it depends on objective, what you want to achieve. Because what we find out is that sometimes the armies, and we say we combine the anti-personal landmine with anti-vehicle landmines, it depends on what impact you want to, to have on the enemy or to cause on the enemy. And this is where the danger is. Because if I'm going to put a landmine in, let's say, in a field or in a route where people used to, to go through to get to some objectives, just put anti-personal landmines. But sometimes if you know that, let's say, guerrilla movements or armies are going to use the same route and in huge numbers of people, you may combine that, you know, anti-personal landmine with anti-vehicle landmine, which has got a huge impact and of course the level of destruction is also bigger than caused by anti-personal landmine alone, anti-personal landmine alone. So what's to be done about it, David? How, how do you tackle this? And then how do you tackle it diplomatically? <coughs> and is there any chance of progress? Um, I think you've got to tackle it at two levels. At a policy level, we have arguably the world's most successful weapon control treaty. And even if not every country in the world has signed it, the vast majority have. People are just not making these things. They are going to become extinct. That's an extraordinary achievement. Mm -hmm. So at a policy level, we, sh we should not be gloomy about this. I mean, and it, it, you're right, Ambassador, it has plateaued a little bit. But that doesn't matter. Every year, year after year, we are taking these things out of the ground. We are going to make mines history. That's a fabulous achievement, and we've just got to carry it through. You know, Mozambique is now mine-free. One of the great Portuguese-speaking countries of Africa is mine-free. There is no reason why Angola couldn't be as well if we put our minds to it. The second thing is down at the grassroots level. This is a scalable problem. It's a finite problem. It's a visible solution. If you fund this, you can come and see the work happening. Many, many other areas of international aid are incredibly important, perhaps arguably more important, but they're not as visible. This stuff can be seen in action. You can come and watch us doing this. It's scalable because a child can fund it with a week's pocket money to clear a single landmine, or a billionaire can clear a whole country. We have an anonymous American billionaire right now clearing two whole countries. That's extraordinary. This can be done. Mm. James, it's that can-do spirit. What, what, what makes you, <laughs> it makes I want to sort of really, really cheer. Um, I'm not, I know that uh, we, in, we in the Foreign Office don't in any way dampen the can-do spirit. <laughs> On the contrary. Uh, but give us a sense of how much progress we've made in mobilising going forward, what we might do in terms of arms control going forward. I think um, uh, well, we, are, we remain optimistic. Um, we remain determined. I think that's a very important yes. word. We remain, I suppose, as well, relentless. Um, there are a whole group of people around the world, and particularly specialists in the International Disarmament Fora, who talk about nothing but this all the time. Mm -hmm. That dialogue is important. But I think there are people like me who operate bilaterally with a country, in this case, Angola. Um, and we maintain this dialogue as part of our overall bilateral discussion and debate. We keep those issues alive through that discussion. Uh, you also have to keep your brain active on this, and you have to look for the opportunities. Uh, you look for the new developments. As I said in my comments, we're constantly looking for innovative ways of getting more funding into demining activity. We're getting, we, we want new approaches so that we can leap forward, push this, move, this movement forward, and keep our eyes on that goal of 2025, particularly for Angola, but for the treaty as a whole. 2025 is not that far away, no. but in theory, it is achievable. Thank you very much. I'm going to come to the panel in a second, well, no, in a three minutes, uh, for the final uh, final words. But before we do, this is the last opportunity, the fickle finger of fate is going to move from left to right. So if you want to make a statement, ask a question, this is your last chance uh, to, uh, uh, to do it. So it's moving, it's moving, it's moving. Ah, you're just in time, sir, you. Yep, and then the guy behind you. Go on. Just me, so yes, Gerhard, Trust, Gerhard Zank, formerly of the Halo Trust, 
And I might just help the Colonel with uh, the question you said about the Angolan Armed Forces and how they're directly helping. Because I was part of the team, the, the funding that's going to clear these two national parks is coming through the Angolan government, which is fantastic. And then we, we were asked, and it's coming through the Ministry of Defence, and we were asked to sit down and do a, a planning task as to how it would be, how the job would be done. And just to sort of summarise, uh, the Angolan Armed Forces will be tackling the roads. They'll be spearheading the clearance of the roads, which then relates to the question of tank mines on roads. And following up from that, their phase two will be to, the, to do the infrastructure uh, for the parks that will be set up. And following all that, Hala will then be working in the communities to do the clearance of the minefields that affect the communities. Thank you very much. Sir? I'm Dan Saber from The Guardian. I'm not going to stand up because I'm going to drop my laptop and everything else. Um, just following on from James Cowan's remarks about uh, landmines, the fact these munitions have been, you know, not being made by state actors. Isn't the problem now that these munitions are being made by non-state actors? So I just wanted your thoughts on how you deal with IEDs, which are arguably proliferating, that okay. Angola is a kind of different kind, is a kind of conflict. What the situation in Angola is emblematic of a, of a kind of conflict that used to exist, but doesn't okay. unfortunately exist now. This section, no, this is your last chance, over here. No, right. We're going to now have brief final words uh, from all of you along. If you want to say anything, this is your opportunity to do it. Don't feel obliged to. There is someone. Where are they? I can't see them. Yeah, all right. Very briefly, sir. Uh, Pedro Bezerra. Uh, I'm a co-founder of Engage in Angola Diaspora in UK. Welcome. And uh, we are really worried about the victims. About and the, the victims. Victims. And trauma, because we we listen, uh, we hear about the 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 the, the mining, but we are more worried about the training and education for for those victims. Thank you very much. We're going to capture that because it's a very important point, and it mirrors the point made by you, sir, about the health implications. Thank you. We begin with you. Yeah, uh, and I think, uh, you know, it's, this is very, very wonderful discussion, and I think that uh, we as an African Wildlife Foundation, we are very optimistic about, about Africa, but I think the discussion needs to be a, a little bit more uh, uh, holistic in a sense that what's going to happen in these areas is going to be affected by the decisions being made in Rwanda in the capital city. So that, that connection is very real. The connection with the youth is very, very, very important. Africa has a huge opportunity today that we have the, the largest population of educated Africans we've never had. So that involvement of the young Africans in finding solutions, whether technologically or otherwise, is very, very important to our Thank success. You Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I guess um, sourcing this critically needed funding uh, to, towards demining is the first step in um, enabling the establishment of conservation development um, infrastructure for the parks um, to enable effective management of the parks, uh, empowerment of the local communities to become uh, stakeholders in, in, the, in the protection of, of the wildlife and benefit um, from, from the potential parks and, and conservation areas. And, and that can all be done through community-based natural resource management. Thank you. Colonel, last words? Uh, well, I would want to say that this is a very important task to the Angolan government, and especially for the Angolan Armed Forces. We are fully engaged, in fact, from all the, 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 the parts involved, the stakeholders in the demining process. The Angolan Armed Forces got the major portion of, in terms of people, the mining brigades and everything, and we are fully committed to that. Thank you. Yeah. Jane. The Mine Ban Treaty broke so many rules in coming about in the first place. Um, and the late Princess of Wales is a crucial part of, of, of making that happen. So let's continue breaking those rules and defying what usually happens by actually being part of this international success story of Landmine Free 2025. Angola is absolutely critical in it and we can take that story even further. Thank you. Let's Jessica. Go. I think three things. First of all, this treaty has only existed for 22 years. There are treaties that have existed for a lot longer and achieved a lot less. Mm -hmm. It is a focus for action. 
It remains a mechanism for action and cooperation. And ultimately, there is a very real possibility that at some time in our lifetimes, um, it may actually be, become a vehicle for success. Thank you. James. Um, to address the question from the Guardian journalist, uh, we began with Rory Stewart. Uh, the £100 million pounds that the United Kingdom announced for mine action is something that they should be congratulated for. The UK has done a fabulous thing. The United States is in the room. The United States is the biggest uh, supporter of uh, mine action in the world. That is also a fabulous thing. But we have a new threat. The improvised explosive device is laid by non-state actors. It won't be subject to a rules-based international order. It has a very brutal effect. The casualties are rising. Of the, the United Kingdom's Department for International Development's budget of £15 billion pounds a year, there is only one weapon control uh, policy, and that is for mines. I would like to see that Global Mine Action Programme matched by the United Kingdom by a second fund, a Global Weapon Reduction Programme, let's call it, that clears improvised explosive devices and the other horrors that are now afflicting the new countries where we are in Libya, in Yemen, in Iraq in Syria and old places like Afghanistan where we're rapidly turning. Where I once worked in Afghanistan as a soldier in Helmand, I'm now back there with the Halo Trust in Helmand. These are the places we need to go and we can do two things at once. We can clear countries like Angola and we can address the, the really toxic effects of improvised explosive devices. Thank you, James. Adriano. Oh, yes. Um, I'd like just to make to mention regarding the um, Tower Convention. So uh, it's a very important tool for us as state parties. Uh, it's 163 state parties joined. And so we, um, we take all this opportunity to share for information sharing experience and also for cooperation uh, between state party and uh, others as well. So I would like not to uh, finish without saying to stress the importance of the Angolan government uh, give to this uh, particular issue of the mining. So as a uh, um, member of the ELO said, uh, Angola is, um, is financing uh, the, the, the project of Kavango Zambes at the start, at the beginning, and uh, we had opportunity to discuss with ELO to see areas that ELO is going to work. Um, so ELO came more than six times to our office um, just to discuss and to see the, um, the, the 153 areas that uh, they're going to tackle in very soon. I believe that uh, it's going to start very soon because the agreement has been signed uh, between the Minister of Defense and ELO for the release of the 20 million uh, US dollars for, for stunting point. And so there is going to be in the four uh, of the eight uh, municipality of the Kwando uh, Kubango. It's mean Mavinga, uh, Spirito Carnaval, uh, Rivungu, and Dirico. So they're going to clear 153 areas. So it's good to, to stress the point that uh, the government of Angola is seriously committed. Uh, despite uh, the crisis that we are in this, uh, this time in Angola. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. So a real partnership, hopeful, resolute, focused, those are the words. And you'll remember, it's each and every feather that makes the eagle soar. Each and every one of us. Action, focused, resolute, determined. Thank you. Thank you, Right Honourable Lord Bertang and the panel for a really interesting, engaging discussion on connecting conservation, sustainable development and mine action. We're now drawing to a close to this conference. And again, a reminder to everybody that this meeting is fully on the record and it is being live streamed. I've got great pleasure to welcome back to the United Kingdom, but I think the first time at Chatham House, Honourable Paula Cuellu, who is the Minister of the Environment of the Republic of Angola, uh, she arrived from Angola yesterday, and I'm delighted that she can give us a call to action. So tell us exactly what the Angolan government is doing. And uh, no, if you could stand here, that would be better, because you're being live streamed. Everyone can see you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. 
and I can just say, Your Highness Prince Harry. Allow me to call you all, my dear friends, and brothers and sisters from all the same mother as Mother Earth. I'm here standing before you just to congratulate this initiative with all partners that we see here. So allow me also for, and with the protocol observed, to greet you under the name of the Excellency, the President of the Republic of Angola. It is indeed known as a country with enormous conservation and the enormous amount of wars that has been tackled. But allow me also to tell you that other part that is now available for all of us to be there, as we heard from the panelists, different but action that should be done. Let's start the mining, and this is why we are here. We also have an enormous talent population, not only as young as like me, we just heard we are very few in the Southern Africa. What will be an Angolan environment minister say to you all? I'm not saying that you are not young, but with the experience that you have. <laughs> what am I gaining back from you to take home and say, dear fellows, let us fight the mining. Let us have progress. And here we are after four decades of success. And Angola has for a long time seen as a closed and paranoid, corrupt and authoritarian country. Now this is all out. We all follow the news. We are now live streaming. But let me tell you what I got with, inside my heart and the desire to engage with the international community. The Angola government knows its needs to diversify beyond oil and meet its aspiration on the youngsters like us. The conservation sector is a scene as a case study. Angola knows its needs outside expertise and investment to help preserve its environment and is looking for assistance. It has shortage on capacity, but there is a short on that we all together can tackle a goodwill towards outsiders who want to help Angola to protect its environment. Angola is part of the CASA TFCA and is committed on the mining. Excellency, the president has given 60 million US dollars to the mining, as we just heard here by the room, on the first year, 20 million and we are in a process also to demine. But not only demining, but also to certify the areas that are already demined so that you as investors can come to the country. We have more than 13% of the areas that covers national parts. Some of them, they are free, and to that stage, we are negotiating with the African parts through the ICCF Foundation, or carcasses, so that we can start having a proper management together with communities, local authorities, and of course, not forgetting the past, and now integrating the ex-militaries as rangers. They call themselves as soldiers for nature. Now what we do with this soldier for nature, in just this land of 91,000 kilometers square, we are doing and completing a task that inspection, monitoring, and guarantee of the quality of the work is carried out properly. We deliver the certificates as a guarantee of a quality control for investors to come in. We would like to carry out also a national intersectorial commission for the mining. As here we heard our colleagues that we, as a different sector, and integrating with all countries' sectors, we are here also to push humanitarian and civil society to talk about the mining and environmental conservation. Ladies and my lord, in this regard, Angola has a high hope that the British government, in which all partners here present today, we will tackle also the elephant conservation program. We're enthusiastic to be part of the initiative of the protection of the elephant and to develop a long-term plans for protected areas, rewriting its judicial goal and incorporative wilderness crimes, climbing down on ivory smuggling, but Angola has a potential to hold elephants and much more than we have now. 
We are delighted to recall last year's the commitment that we heard from the government of uh, you, uh, British government to helping Angola and the initiative so that we can further discuss with the other colleagues in the region and we can become part of the problem within SADC area. We find common solutions with resumption in the ivory trade versus British government policy and all other conventions that are part of the treaty that we can all be together. This has not always been easy, indeed, for Angola, but Angola has stood step still, and I believe that what is right, Angola will continue to do. We have the guidance of the President of Angola, and major donors like you, all here present, we would like to take some of the dreams into reality. It's not about money, it's not only about the mining, it's about what we do, what is the call, what is the global action. In relation to all we have said now, it's a crucial that the solution of all the issues raised here, from the community point of view, for what I think and what I'll be understanding as passing on this message, what I can restore and what I can do for clear minings and why is there a reason that we should not return back home. Like elephants, they do not recognize borders. They don't have passports, but they move freely. I'm just taking elephants because it's the symbol of Africa, what we mostly and recently have heard. But I also want to push you as a specific specimen under in danger. You yourself looking at me. But let me also say that we are very much appreciated and grateful for all the inputs that the government, the British government is doing for Angola and all the initiatives that we have joined worldwide. We are going still to have some availability to discuss and to continue to talk about side by side the wishes and desires of Angola. And with that regard, Your Highness, I would like with the support of you all here to open the corridors so that the pressure in the SADC region can be less, elephants can return home, Home we call as casa, casa we call as a common position, a common view, and to all other conservation areas in the Africa and all other countries of the world. I would not end up saying that we need to pledge an appeal of a common sense, not only about a global action, but a common sense. And we thank you once again for listening to a Portuguese speaker that doesn't know how to speak English. <laughs> thank you very much. Honourable Palaquayu, thank you so much for the call for action, and uh, I wish my Portuguese was as good as your English, so con <laughs> congratulations. Well, we got opened this morning by uh, Dr. Rui uh, Mangueira, the Ambassador of Angola, so we're now going to have the concluding remarks from His Royal Highness, the Duke of Sussex, who has, uh, throughout this conference, uh, we've been discussing the, the importance of mine action economic development and conservation in Angola, uh, and it is something that I know is close to his heart. His Royal Highness, if you'd come up here, please, and give your closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Honourable, Honourable Minister, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's a great pleasure in joining you to focus on such an important collaborative goal. This event is the culmination of a great effort by many people to progress the vital mission of demining Angola and putting it back on the map as a tourist destination. Angola has some of the world's most important remaining wilderness that is critical to biodiversity and an asset that should be protected, celebrated and benefited by its people. The ambition of the partners gathered here to create a safer environment for communities and wildlife for the success of the country is to be applauded. I first visited Chatham House in June 2017 to take part in a scenario planning exercise. Some of you in the room today were here with me. That exercise showed me the importance of landmine clearance within a humanitarian emergency because, let's not forget, landmines are a humanitarian issue and not a political one. 
That exercise was especially interesting for me because I had the privilege in 2013 of visiting Angola with the Halo Trust. In Cuando Cabango, in the far southeast of what is a vast, beautiful country, I saw a struggling community in a deserted landscape, unable to make use of the land, yet the potential to turn this land into a sustainable source for its people. In fact, I was told just the other day of the positive transformation in Huambo since my mother walked that minefield all those years ago. What is less well known is the impact landmines can have on conservation and wildlife, and therefore the economy. We've heard how this is especially the case in the national parks and wilderness areas of southeast Angola, including the precious and again vital watershed of the Okavango Delta. This unique ecosystem is one of the great wildlife refuges of the world, enriching its biodiversity for all of humanity. My hope is that through this collaboration, minefields can be cleared, land can be protected, wildlife can be free to return to where they once roamed, and Angolans can reap the rewards by coexisting with the one constant that will draw people in from all over the world, the extraordinary setting that they call home. Angola is an important example of a country leading the way in clearing the remnants of war to secure a better future for its people and its environment. It has been a long journey, one full of heartache and frustration, I'm sure. But now, with the optimism and encouragement from your government minister, I truly believe that Angola will become a shining example to the rest of the continent. The funding announced today will help protect human lives and is the first step in allowing local communities to protect wildlife through the kind of conservation-led development that has been so crucial elsewhere on the continent. Considerable progress has been made, but there is still a huge amount to do, which is why it encourages me to see so many of you here today as we shine a light on the work that's been done, but also how we can help moving forward. The fact that demining funding has been reduced by nearly 90% over the last decade is pretty shocking, and we hope that today will encourage those countries not to leave a job left half done. As long as landmines are in the ground in Angola, we aren't really giving them a chance. There is an end in sight, which has already been discussed, and that isn't always the case. So let's make the most of this opportunity. I hope you will all join me in thanking the government of Angola for this significant commitment to supporting its communities, its wildlife, and the biodiversity of this planet. Thank you. His Royal Highness, the Duke of Sussex, thank you very much for that presentation outlining uh, your own commitment to this particular issue. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my Lord, if you could remain seated uh, as the Duke leaves this room. Uh, I want to thank everybody again for participating in this meeting, uh, and uh, all the proceedings will be up on the Chatham House website. It's been recorded. Thank you for those who've been live streaming. Uh, we very much appreciate. We've had record numbers of people live streaming today. Thank you very much.